Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, for our fourth battle brief. Uh, this is an ongoing series that we're offering almost monthly uh, on the first Tuesday uh, of the month. And we're very pleased to have with us tonight, Philip Greenwald, and I'll introduce him in just a second, but to our audience, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, looks like we got a very sizable crowd tonight and we're gonna be able to take questions um, after the presentation and chat that we're gonna have with, uh, with Phil here in a second. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, we have a, um, uh, if we could go with the first slide as we introduce uh, Phil for uh, the audience members here. Um, Philip Greenwald is the co-founder of the Emerging Revolutionary War book series of which he has a title coming out in about eight days that we'll talk about here on Valley Forge. Uh, he's a full-time uh, full contributor to uh, another series called The Emerging Civil War, both of those published by Savas Beatty in California. He's also the author or co-author of five books on the Revolutionary War and the Civil War, including the forthcoming title, The Winter That Won the War, The Winter Encampment at Valley Forge. Um, so from 1777 to 1778. And Phil is also a uh, supervisory park service uh, employee who is currently stationed uh, ironically, in the Everglades, which is a long way from Valley Forge, but uh, he's done his homework and his research, and uh, and uh, he's he knows a lot about Valley Forge. So uh, the Everglades, notwithstanding, notwithstanding, Philip, a very warm welcome to you. Glad glad you're with us. Oh, thank you, John, and yeah, appreciate it. Uh, it's also slightly a bit warmer in the Everglades than uh, Valley Forge as well. So just just a bit. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for being with us. Uh, before we start in on uh, Valley Forge, uh, tell us a little bit about the book series, The Emerging Revolutionary War. I've, I've, got a few, I've got a few copies of other titles, but there's a lot more planned. And, and uh, uh, how about uh, giving us an overview of that series? Certainly. Uh, so the series um, mirrors the one that started with the American Civil War. Uh, the goal is, is to provide that that first book that someone who either knows a little bit about the subject or has seen a brown sign or is driven by one of these uh, battlefield or historic sites, give them uh, enough information to, to wet the whistle or to introduce them into um, these major events in our American history. And also provide a roadmap on how to explore farther, uh, whether through a driving tour, walking tours, or a suggested reading. Um, the goal is, is that when you see these fields, we want to turn them from these green grass fields back into the hollowed ground that makes us, uh, as Americans, who we are today. And so the Revolutionary War series kicked off um, with uh, Lexington Concord and, and Trenton and Princeton, two of the um, major, I mean, focal campaigns, focal points of the war. Um, we've continued out with Monmouth Courthouse and, and Valley Forge uh, kind of bookends themselves. Um, and then in the future, we do have Camden, Charleston, uh, New Jersey are all coming out within the next year, uh, the two years. And yeah, we um, are rolling, uh, trying to continue on with books like the Yorktown campaign, some biographies of people like John Adams and Benedict Arnold. So the goal is yeah, to provide uh, a brief into what uh, this emerging Revolutionary War era and then get people interested um, and out to these sites. Great. Great. Uh, many of our audience uh, members yeah. might that in January our book talk was on Malloy's uh, very good book on Trenton Princeton. So that, that's that's one of the series too. Yeah. So let's let's start talking a little bit about Valley Forge here, which is the subject of your book that comes out next week. Um, the the move to Valley Forge in December of 1777 wasn't random or or uh, or coincidental. This all, this all began with the Pennsylvania Philadelphia campaign in 1777. So can you tell us about how those, the battles of Brandywine and, and um, Germantown and, and the campaign, how that affected what Washington decided to do for the winter? Certainly. Uh, so 
obviously, as uh, the campaign season starts uh, with both of the armies uh, up in either northern New Jersey, uh, where Washington ended the 1776 campaign um, after the uh, the good victories of Trenton and Princeton, um, Sir William Howe, um, as well as trying to figure out a way, uh, he's in Scone in New York City. Um, and so uh, initially, without being able to drag Washington out of the Watchung Mountains and the northern New Jersey uh, highlands, he decides to take his army by uh, boat initially. Up, his goal is to get up the Delaware River, uh, which, of course, runs up into Philadelphia. But he tends to go farther because of the defenses that are along the uh, Delaware River. Uh, and he lands in the Chesapeake ahead of Elk um, and starts the, uh, the campaign from northern Maryland. Um, Brandywine is a defensible creek in southeast Pennsylvania. Uh, it's actually, I think, the largest battle by uh, force size in the American Revolution. It's fought on September 11th, 1777. Uh, Washington's forces are uh, flanked, uh, the right flank, um, by another circuitous movement, similar to what Howe had done in New York uh, during the campaign there in the previous summer. Um, with the pushback there, um, obviously, uh, Washington has a choice. He can either start to defend the capital or he can defend the supply and military depots that are more in central or western Pennsylvania, uh, York and Reading. Um, later on, of course, uh, there are smaller actions um, at Paoli um, and the Battle of the Clouds uh, later in September uh, of uh, 1777. Uh, but Washington uh, gives up Philadelphia. Um, it's actually, um, it falls to the British forces on September 26th of that year. Um, and of course, this is a, um, a black mark on Washington. He's not able to defend the capital. But what's uh, unique is that if you're, if we transplant this war into Europe, the, the loss of a capital is usually the checkmate of a, of a war. But in here, the Congress had already uh, fled uh, Philadelphia multiple times, uh, even the year before uh, going down to Baltimore. Um, so they head out. Uh, of course, the state government of Philadelphia hands out, uh, heads out as well, of uh, Pennsylvania, excuse me. Uh, so Washington um, is hovering around the city, and he uh, decides in early October with this grandiose plan to, um, to try to destroy a segment. About 8,000 British soldiers are outside of town at a little uh, suburb of Germantown. Um, and a, an amazing, um, probably over-sophisticated attack plan actually almost comes to fruition if it wasn't for some fog and, the, uh, and Clive in there, um, a stone house that gets caught behind uh, some of the American forces. Washington listens to his chief of artillery, Henry Knox, um, and they divert forces uh, to try to attack. And that's, if you Google Germantown, that's the one image that comes up. Uh, although, so October 4th, 1777 is another defeat by Washington's forces. Uh, but it's one of those um, victories and defeat, if you say so. Um, it actually plays very well in the French foreign court. Um, I always butcher his name. I try to learn French, but Virgens, I think, um, is, um, is amazed that Washington is able to take the field less than a month after um, the big defeat at Brandywine. And so Washington uh, will stay in the immediate area for the next uh, few months. Um, there is another um, almost engagement at uh, White Marsh there in December, uh, early December of 1777. Um, Washington does not take the bait of coming off uh, entrenched positions. Um, so now he's looking for a place um, to winter for the 1777-1778. He wants to stay close enough to Philadelphia to continue to control the countryside, to continue to keep the British somewhat penned in, um, but also to um, actively uh, patrol the area. Um, he also needs to continue to um, uh, protect York, Reading, Lancaster, some of these uh, towns that either have the um, Continental Congress, uh, the Pennsylvania state government, or the military depots um, that are necessary for his army to survive. Um, so he does settle uh, on Valley Forge, which is an area about 18 miles uh, from the city center of Philadelphia, um, kind of north, what, northwest uh, of the city there. Um, it is ranged with some defenses um, to uh, prominent hilltops. So it's an area that he can um, manage, defend. Um, but it's also decently well known by the kind of army. Uh, there's actually an action there earlier in the fall campaign, um, a raid by the British to... Um, kind of destroy some of the iron works and get some of the supplies there. Um, so some of the forces are familiar with Valley Forge uh, before they march in on December 19th, uh, 1777. So in a way, Phil, there might not have even been a Valley Forge if Howe 
General Howe, commander of the British forces, acted more aggressively. And oh. so in 1776, as you mentioned, Long Island, uh, a big victory for the British, but not a, not a conclusive one. Uh, Harlem Heights, White Plains, New York, uh, across New Jersey, uh, trying to capture, trying to get at Washington at Trenton and Princeton, and Brandywine again, a, 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 what would arguably be called a, a smashing victory for the British. Why was it how ever able to really conclusively bring Washington's army to a decisive battle and and use use the superior numbers and artillery? Why, why did that never happen, including right before Valley Forge? Uh, multiple reasons. Uh, if you, I mean, initially New York, uh, I think he's um, got the dual uh, responsibilities in his mind to um, defeat Washington's army, but not destroy it because he wants to bring it to the, the table for talks. Uh, he has envisioned himself as a, a peace emissary as well. Um, Hal also is... Um, Scarred from Bunker Hill uh, and the massive casualties that going up into fortified positions there. And you see a lot of the flanking maneuvers that he is um, uh, very fond of. Um, in addition to uh, Brandywine is a defeat, but it's not a rout like it is in New York. Uh, the Washington's army does leave the field. Um, there is some um, great um, delay in actions by uh, some of the troops. Uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, is, of course, gets most of the renown. He is wounded in a calf there, um, but they don't it's not a precipitate retreat. Um, how also, um, I think a lot has to be said about how long it takes him to get from New York to Chesapeake. Um, he loses a lot of his um, support, uh, the horses, um, the, the men have to regain their legs. Uh, there is a long march around the flank at Brandywine as well. Um, so Washington um, is cagey as well. Um, he is, um, I mean, he has learned how to retreat, I guess, is the, is the best way to, to say it. Um, but yeah, Hal also has to husband his horses because he's at the end of a, what, a 3,000 mile supply line. Um, there is not, I mean, he has Hessian and German uh, mercenary troops because the British army is not that big. Um, and they are around the globe and they are in the Caribbean and so forth. So um, he is uh, careful of committing to those all out attacks that Bunker Hill was. I think that plays a major part in his psyche uh, moving forward. Sure, thanks. So back to December of 1777, uh, these winter quarters were typically entered into by military forces in the 18th century due to uh, lack of mobility and the roads becoming either snowy, muddy, icy, and uh, supplies being a little bit on the limited side compared to harvest season. But why Valley Forge? Well, why Valley Forge and not somewhere else? What was it that convinced Washington and presumably some of his senior officers that that was the best place to spend the winter? Uh, a few factors. Proximity. Uh, you want to stay as close to uh, Philadelphia as possible, but you also want to stay far enough away where you're not going to be surprised. Um, so it is a decent um, like 18 miles or so, maybe uh, 15 miles from the outer defenses, uh, so forth from uh, Howell's army. So you keep a watch on it. It also uh, tries to pen in uh, the British as close to Philadelphia as possible. Um, there is uh, what Mount Joy and Mount uh, Spar, I think, are the other two uh, mountains there. That there are some heights. Uh, it is uh, a defensible area. Um, there is a uh, there's water, um, so that's always important. Uh, there is um, and it masks some of the supply lines, supply networks that he's able uh, to handle. Uh, once again, going back to the depots and so forth, that's why he gave up Philadelphia in the first place. Uh, protect the military supplies, the military stores. They put some um, also within um, uh, channels of communication into uh, New Jersey. Um, he also has a contingent of um, some of his best troops, Maryland and Delaware soldiers in Wilmington. So there is an encampment there as well. So he has a cordon around Philadelphia um, to try to keep an eye. And if you combine with the, um, the river forts, Mifflin and Mercer, um, because when he goes into uh, Philadelphia, how? Um, the Delaware is still blocked. Um, there is a uh, small uh, American Navy uh, riverine force there. There are two forts uh, that are guarding block entry, and there's a possibility that Howe could be starved out of Philadelphia. And so Washington needs to be nearby. Now, 
Washington also is not going to give up whether he can attack in the winter. Um, there, I mean, he has tried it, obviously, with success at Trenton and Princeton. Uh, later in the war, he also um, looks at attacking across the ice at New York um, and uh, with Sullivan's forces and so forth. So um, he is always looking for that, that chance. So, yeah, there is um, what he needs to keep the, the troops. Um, there's plenty of lumber to build their, fortific- uh, their winter huts which are important, uh, enough wood as well to uh, fuel the fire. So it is an area that has stuff for it. Um, it is defensible, and it's close by the British. So how many troops did Washington have when he um, moved in his army to Valley Forge? So, uh, that's always a great question because um, Washington never really uh, knew exactly men are coming and going. Um, the number that is um, routinely accepted is about 12,000 soldiers that come into uh, Valley Forge in the winter. Um, and so those are um, quickly um, put into, uh, of course, building huts. Washington issues a order of uh, down to the size of what the hut should be and how many soldiers should be in each hut. Um, it's 14 by 16 um, with 18 inches of clay for insulation and about 8 to 12 men per hut. Um, I think he also gives... Uh, what incentives for the first huts that can be completed um, and, and so forth. So an incentive for the troops to move quick. Unfortunately, there are a lot of it's done by hand and rudimentary tools. There's not enough of uh, supplies for these troops, but um, about 12,000 um, are uh, around the army on December 19th, 1777. So was at, at, in 1777-1778, was Valley Forge in an area that had a lot of food and supplies and farms, or was this, was this a barren, isolated area at the time? No, there is. Um, I mean, Philadelphia had, um, I want to say, a bumper crop year, but they had um, a lot of foodstuffs available. Unfortunately, um, the, a lot of these farmers... Um, are going to look for the British uh, because they uh, provide hard coin. They provide uh, hard specie for, uh, for payment. Um, Washington actually will set up patrols, uh, some of his cavalry, uh, militia, uh, Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania militia to try to stop some of these wagons from coming forward. Um, so we always think that it's a bleak winter, but it's really um, the supplies are there in the general area. Um, what also um, hurts the American army is a lack of a efficient quartermaster or transportation um, department. Uh, Mifflin, Thomas Mifflin, um, effectively resigns in November going home to his mansion. Um, and he'll, we'll probably talk about him a little more. And it's not till early March, I think March 2nd, when Nathaniel Green is actually confirmed by the Continental Congress to be the quartermaster general of the uh, Continental Army. In addition, um, the Army suffers uh, from a lack of one or the other. They have um, major depots of foodstuffs that are rotting throughout, the, even as far away as Connecticut and um, New York. They don't have the wagons to bring them. Uh, when they do have the wagons, they don't have the money to pay for them. Um, so you have a myriad of issues that affect the Continental Army. Uh, but there is food there now. We are always, in our mind's eye, see Valley Forge um, covered in snow and, um, and very cold, um, which it was in the coldest winter. Um, it was in the most snowy winter that belongs to uh, Morristown in 1779-1780, but it was cold enough that the roads would turn to muck and mud, and that was probably even worse than snow and ice because it's hard to uh, move horses and wagons through this stuff. And so there's a combination of issues that affect the American Army from their own supply chain and quartermaster department to the uh, depreciation of continental currency. If you're a farmer in Pennsylvania, the British are offering you hard money. The Americans are offering you a piece of paper that could be worth, what, today, one one hundredth of what it is tomorrow or $10 or 10 cents to the dollar. So um, where are you going to trade this extra food to? Um, So it is um, an issue there as well. So if I remember correctly, Phil, there were a couple periods after the first of the year that were particularly cold, I think one in February. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the worst of the conditions and uh, not only the weather, but uh, the shortage of supplies? Sure, yes, you're right. Uh, late February, there was a, uh, a cold winter. There were snow dumps on there. Um, there are great accounts uh, from guys like Jedediah um, Huntington 
uh, from Connecticut um, and other ones who uh, talk about, uh, as you see in the picture there, the, uh, the snowfalls that come in um, and blanket the area. Um, and of course, um, the huts, um, as you see, they're kind of uh, designed in order, um, but there is not a regularity to them. Um, they, this is a system that they will perfect over the winter. Um, but to give you an idea, uh, when um, January 31st of that year, um, um, as Green is kind of taken over the quartermaster, he's not confirmed yet, but uh, Washington has kind of tabbed him. Um, he is uh, kind of Washington's right-hand man. He says that uh, there's about 60, if 63,000 pounds of, of meat available. Um, and he goes, if you gave one pound per man um, to the Army, if you put 12, it's still 12,000 men in, they had a complete five day ration of meat at that time. Um, and so, I mean, put it in, that's January. Um, so that's even before that snowfall in February, uh, before um, they're able to set up. Um, and, and so the men um, will um, be down with the lean rations. I mean, uh, one third, one fifth of what they're supposed to be having, um, which obviously will affect their health, um, a myriad of diseases. Um, um, living in cramped conditions, unsanitary conditions. Um, there's also a neat uh, factor that comes into play, and that's actually um, in uh, later in the encampment uh, with the arrival of some Oneida Native Americans. Um, we teach them how to make corn husk soup and so forth. That actually provides a supplemental diet. A lady named Polly Cooper, um, who actually is uh, gifted a shawl um, that is still in the um, Oneida Native American uh, possession. Uh, I think it's up at their museum in New York. Uh, but yeah, it is... Um, uh, foodstuffs will, uh, soldiers will struggle to eat food. Um, some will um, get down to eating what's left of their shoes or uh, boiling rocks or, um, or whatnot. Um, but yeah, it is dire. It is snowy. Uh, as you see, the major snowfalls, there's two or three throughout the winter, uh, but it's, it's, it's cold. <laughs> so you mentioned Thomas Mifflin as the quartermaster as being ineffective and and what what was the problem that Mifflin faced and what was his uh what were his shortcomings well the Mifflin um uh initially is a, him and Washington do work closely together um but Mifflin um gets upset that Washington and Green uh become a little closer associates um Mifflin gets more frustrated with what happens um, throughout the campaigning, uh, the loss of Philadelphia. He is a native Pennsylvanian. Uh, so he effectively goes home to his mansion in November of 1777, um, offers his rising nation. Um, he uh, becomes more embroiled in uh, trying to set up the board of war. Um, and also a um, lot has been brought up by historians later of the Conway Cabal, or, okay, um, which um, is not as... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for, not as effective or of removing Washington as we thought. Um, so you have this pretty much a four-month period where the kind of the Congress is sitting on a resignation waiting for uh, or waiting to confirm Washington's replacement where the men that are suffering are the ones that are in those log huts that we just showed. Um, so because of Mifflin going home, uh, having these dinner parties, um, kind of conniving behind Washington's back to set up a board of war, he's more interested in, in, in those uh, initiatives than actually fulfilling what's left of his responsibilities to the court master general. And so the men suffer because they're at the end of this tenuous supply chain um, and their are food rotting. There are men not being paid there. Um, so Green comes in and actually does it such a great job that the Continental Congress starts to investigate um, how well the job he's doing because of uh, the lack of funds that he's supposedly receiving. So, um, uh, and obviously, Green learns uh, a great lesson there that carries him through the rest of the war. So in addition to the tough, uh, very tough times with the weather and the supplies, Valley Forge is also uh, well known for the transformation of the Continental Army. And one of the key individuals uh, involved in that was uh, Baron von Steuben. And so can you tell us a little bit about his background? Uh, was, was, he, was he really a Baron? There's, there's a, lot of, a lot of mythology around him. And uh, what's, what's the real story on von Steuben? So von Steuben uh, is a, a staff officer from the, in the Prussian army. Um, he does um, 
I uh, believe get a baroncy, not from them, but from a small German principality. Um, but he goes and he, he impresses um, the American ministers uh, in Paris. And I think it's Ben Franklin who uh, kind of beefs up his resume. And von Steuben arrives uh, without uh, much fanfare there in, uh, in the winter. Um, at the same time, Washington uh, is embroiled in this um, back and forth with the Continental kind of Congress um, and the committees there uh, because a, a gentleman, Thomas Conway, uh, has been named the Inspector General. Um, and Washington has um, previously received letter uh, uh, or communication between him and Gates um, that talks a little bit about insubordination and so forth. Um, so Baron von Stoven uh, doesn't speak English. He speaks, uh, of course, uh, German and French. He arrives. Um, he has, uh, but he has a knack um, for ingratiating himself with Washington. He uh, shows up, um, much like the Marquis de Lafayette, he's not under pretenses. A lot of these foreign soldiers, foreign officers that come expecting big commissions, brigadier generals, major generals, or, or pay, and so forth. Uh, but von Stilgen realizes quickly um, that the American soldier is a, has a different psyche. You can't beat stuff into them like the Prussians did. Um, they're not, so you have to, um, so he mends what is called the Blue Book, um, and, he, and he trains a model company um, that trains there. Um, there's a great statue of Baron von Stilgen now at Valley Forge National Historical Park looking out over the fields. And he trains this model company that then allows that uh, those um, individuals to go train other ones. And at the time, he attracts the attention of um, onlookers and so forth. Uh, uh, one of the uh, clips is that uh, von Stilben has an aide, and he keeps telling him to, uh, can you cuss at these soldiers in English for me? Um, uh, translate what I'm saying. Um, and so the first words he learns is probably uh, what goes on around military camps today that is probably not, um, would get me kicked off with this chat um, and so forth. But um yeah, von Steuben's uh, role is, is to, yeah, to train um, and uh, the army, and he does spend hours at it. Um, so he uh, does get a, a major general seat. Um, and what's remarkable is that it is um, accepted by the other officers as well. Um, so he does, and he stays and does yeoman service throughout the rest of the war, including uh, down in, um, I guess, your neck of the woods uh, in Virginia there in uh, 1780, 1781. But yeah, um, he is uh, arrives. Um, uh, without much fanfare, um, and although he is a baron, uh, not a baron in, in the Prussian uh, forces, but is, um, you can see the U.S. Army, his work is done when you see the U.S. Army going to places like uh, Barron Hill or Monmouth um, shortly in 1778. So you mentioned the Blue Book. What what was that exactly? Uh, uh, it was a manual that, that, uh, that he developed. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? All right, so yeah, manual of, uh, of arms, of drilling, uh, from um, how to go from uh, uh, line to, or column to line, um, the steps of uh, loading, um, how to, um, to, to fire. I mean, things that um, are trained in the U.S. Army and the U.S. military forces today, uh, you have, um, I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's unwieldy. Uh, coming in, it's a 12-step uh, musket loading procedure. Um it's obviously something you need to uh, kind of become almost a automated or machine with because of uh, the, the need for immense firepower, but also going from column to line or um, withstanding uh, bayonet charges or how to um, advance and keep a rolling fire and so forth and not trip over each other. Um, how many steps to take in a uh, quick march or how many um, steps um, and what line goes down? First line, kneel. Second line, steps in behind, fires over the left um, shoulder and so forth. And so just rudimentary things that provides on uh, military staff. And um, uh, I think it's the great John Adams who said that uh, when the army marched through in 1777 through Philadelphia, that it didn't have that martial air yet um, that uh, on the way to Brandywine. And that's something that the, the men, um, um, not only the rudimentary skills that are learned in, in the blue book that are passed down uh, through the ages in, um, in military history, but also the belief in that what they're doing um, as military force gives them that uh, the morale boost, uh, gives them that confidence to, to face the line, um, and especially quickly after the end of the winter. Sure. So moving on to another subject within this, the Valley Forge story um, that maybe isn't as well known is any, any modern biography of Washington includes um, his relationship with Congress during this time. And it wasn't always good. And 
he struggled quite a bit with letter after letter after letter to not only Congress, but the state governors, the state legislatures to get supplies. And eventually he convinced Congress to send some of its members to Valley Forge to get a look at the situation. Uh, can you tell us how that came about? And what was the result of that? Sure. Uh, Washington obviously is fighting to uh, preserve an army. Um, and every year, I mean, he's arguing that the need for a standing army, a continental force that uh, will have longer enlistments. Um, so he's writing missiles to, I think it's uh, by the end of the war, but 10,000 pieces of correspondence written by him and his staff. Um, at the same time, he's under siege from this Continental Congress that at times can't even create a quorum. I think there's nine to 13 members uh, at certain parts. Um, but uh, Washington obviously uh, has not won anything in over a year. There were high hopes uh, leading into the campaigning season. Um, there's a gentleman up north, Horatio Gates, that wins uh, defining victory at Saratoga um, in two actions in September, October of 1777. Um, so Washington, um, there is a move, obviously, for the Continental Congress to uh, possibly replace them, maybe. Um, there is this fervor that maybe Gates can um, change the, uh, the outcome. Um, there's a, a letter uh, written by Benjamin Rush, uh, a great doctor um, and signer of the Declaration, right to the Patrick Henry, thinking that Patrick Henry um, would be on his side and so forth. And Henry sends that up to to Washington. So Washington is being bombarded from the Continental Congress, from this new board of war, through uh, um, pleading with these state governments to pass on supplies or troops. Um, same time, he can't really tell the Continental Congress how bad the conditions are at the camp because he doesn't know um, who's loyal um, and who's not. Um, he's fearful that he shows how dire and drastic the conditions are and might be picked up by the British, who could then attack the camp. But then the kind of the Congress are wondering if our condition is really that terrible because he's not letting go. And so Washington um, has a gentleman on his staff, John Lawrence, uh, whose father becomes the president of the Continental Congress, Henry Lawrence. So he has that back channel that he's able to actually bring out um, a few of the uh, uh, members of the Congress. And I think Governor Morris says it's like an army of skeletons uh, when they arrive. Um, another one says that um, Washington unfides the guy named Dana saying that, um, how do I um, build the trust, um, look around, and so forth. And so Washington, uh, this is a major turning point, this, uh, this committee coming to camp, because they see for their own eyes how dire it is. And also the, one of the unsung heroes is Henry Lawrence, the president of the kind of the Congress, who's able to uh, stipend some of this removal speech. But also uh, Washington's biggest victory is how he's able to maneuver uh, between the Continental Congress, his forces, um, I think one of them that uh, uh, says at the end of the um, the winter that the army could have suffered a removal of any officer besides Washington. Uh, that would have been to the the end of. Um, so he solidifies his hold through the six months. But um, I mean, he must have worn a, um, a path in those upper floors of the Potts House, pacing back and forth because he is caught between the proverbial rock and a hard place. Was there a point among the rank and file? Uh, where food was low and no shoes, no blankets. Was there, was there any, uh, was there a mutiny at all during this period of time, especially toward the end of the winter? Uh, there were, I mean, there were some uh, grumblings, obviously. Uh, they're not thinking as major as what happens in, in Morristown uh, later on with the mutinies, uh, I think Pennsylvania and New Jersey lines. Um, there is, I mean, um, desertions. There are um, people taking uh, what French leave, as they call it, and going home. There is a, uh, um, but one of the things um, that, uh, that I think is a great time to bring up is that uh, Washington remains with the army. Um, and that is a, uh, ma um, a major um, point that's the difference between this encampment and then the encampment up in Morristown uh, the following winter when uh, he's about five, six miles from the main encampment of the uh, Continental Army. Washington um, is present now. He never kneels in the snow to pray, uh, but he does uh, head out among the troops. He is there at the Potts House. Um, so he suffers through with them. Um, and uh, so that's a, a major uh, point of emphasis because those Continental uh, soldiers, uh, as they suffer through, I mean, um, it's, it's a band of brothers type thing. Where I don't want to use that term loosely, but he is there. 
Um, and so his presence is there. Um, there are um, men that, yeah, that's, that think the, the game is up. There are about 2,000 or so, about one out of every six men that do succumb to some illness or disease. Um, it's so dire as well that um, they have to put guards on the clothes of men entering into some of the hospitals because men are stealing the clothes um, um, and these men are returning um, with nothing to wear. Um, and so um, there are, it's unbelievable there's not more of a, a mutiny at Valley Forge than there really is. So you mentioned uh, Nathaniel Green, uh, Major General Nathaniel Green, earlier a little bit. Uh, how was he able to improve the supply system when he became quartermaster general? Uh, one of the things he uh, obviously can't, cannot fix it overnight. Um, it, it's going to take time to do. Uh, one of the things he does is um, starts to get the right people in place, um, gets uh, a better um, structure for the, uh, the, the department. He's also um, starts to develop uh, these depots along potential routes. Um, he uh, will start to try to figure out um, the impressment or, or payment of um, wagoneers um, bringing in the food stuff as well. He's also um, able to uh, corral some of these. Uh, the major issue is, is, is oversight. Uh, there's no one operating the day to day. And Nathaniel Green has this tendency to um, commit wholly to uh, a subject. Um, and you see that later, uh, for instance, it was the study of the rivers in the Carolinas and, and Virginia, uh, but the logistics. Um, basically, how do you move the things from point A to point B? How to, um, of course, offer. Um, uh, the financial backing, the, the money to, to pay for things, uh, but also staging stuff along the way um, and also um, yeah, improving the transportation, improving the storage um, and, and rectifying some of the books, um, knowing what is there, what's not and so forth. So uh, it's basically um, a, from a logistical standpoint, it is um, how uh, correcting the mistakes and having the oversight that Mifflin, because he's not there for months, is, is incapable, but also um, getting people in place for a different quartermaster or, or ordinance or substance. And so commissary, because I mean, just like today, there is a bureaucracy he's got to work through. But uh, some of these men have gone home. Some don't have the funding. So he's trying to get the right people in place, trying to um, uh, rectify the books and also develop the stages to get the supplies flowing again, because he's got to talk to the uh, ones in charge of the wagons and transportation, one in charge of the foodstuffs, getting them to talk combine and move it. So uh, it takes time, but um, it, by the uh, campaigning season of 1778, he has some type of uh, semblance of order. Um, he also is probably one of the only quartermasters to go down in history with his name. Uh, so I think that was his big fear. You've never heard a quartermaster um, in the annals of history. Right. Well, he's in the quartermaster hall of fame down at the army quartermaster museum at Fort Lee, uh, which is uh, a great place to visit too. So at some point, Washington has to decide uh, towards spring that he can leave Valley Forge and uh, look at the strategic situation. What was it that eventually prompted Washington to, to take the army uh, out of Valley Forge and start to get a little bit closer toward the British in Philadelphia? Well, it's, um, there are a few instances. Obviously, uh, over the winter, the French recognized uh, the American colonies. Um, this affects the British war strategy because now it's a global conflict. And uh, we, uh, the 13 colonies um, are rebelling, but Britain has some major colonies in the Caribbean that are very important um, for the economics. And so they do have to siphon troops off there. So Washington, of course, is uh, abreast of this. Um, he has um, some spies. He has some scouts out and about. Um, he also realizes that uh, there is a change of leadership as well. Hal goes home. Um, he's replaced by um, um, Sir uh, Clinton, uh, who takes over, Henry Clinton. Um, but he also figures um, a small action on May 20th of 1778 um, kind of determines um, that the British are still there. Um, it's the, the battle, what becomes the Battle of Barren Hill, a small little engagement um, that uh, is under the command of Marquis de Lafayette. Um, but it is um, uh, waiting for the, the British. Will they remove by water? Will they remove by land? Um, he actually uh, does call councils of war. Um, he has the return of his uh, nominal second in command, um, uh, Charles Lee, uh, returns from captivity. Um, so it, it's a, 
it's a wait and see approach to see what the British are going to do. Are they going to evacuate by land? Are they going to evacuate by water? Um, he's got uh, um, the gentleman's name is escaping off the top of my head right now, but he has a cavalry officer that uh, even um, uh, pokes fun at a uh, house, what Miss Cienza, or however you pronounce it, um, uh, were there um, when he departs there in uh, May of 1778. So Washington eventually finally realizes that. Um, the, uh, the British are going to uh, march across um, New Jersey and retreat back across. And he, he does follow, um, and he comes up with a chance to, to strike the rear guard, or what he believes is the rear guard there in Monmouth um, in uh, July, uh, yeah, July of um, 1778. So a few factors there. So the common story, Phil, is that the army emerges from all the training from von Steuben um, and that they uh, eventually gave chase to the British uh, under Sir Henry Clinton on the march back from Philadelphia, which he abandoned to go to New York. And at the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse at the end of June of 1778, uh, many or all of the units demonstrated a, a greater proficiency for marching and standing up to fire, uh, and, and it was a better army. Is, is that your conclusion, or is is that too simplistic? Uh, I mean, if you're looking for the fifty thousand foot view, yes, that uh, is what uh, the army that marches out, uh, ironically, six months to the day uh, after. Um, I think it was June nineteenth, which is remarkable. Um, that's why I like history. March in December nineteenth, leave June nineteenth. Um, the army is different. that comes out. Yes. Uh, the action, I mean, um, the retrograde movement of Charles Lee um, there at Monmouth uh, does not throw the men into panic. Um, it is a very hot uh, day. Uh, it is. Um, but the men do stand up. Um, they go toe to toe. And there is that um, the more spirit they court, the things you can't teach that the men have that morale. Um, there's the, um, they have uh, a semblance of who they are. They're fighting. I mean, that's the last major battle. Uh, in the Northern Theater until, I mean, Washington takes the army to Yorktown. And so you really don't have too many other proving grounds, except that there are uh, forces that um, get detached south on uh, the Maryland and Delaware uh, lines there in um, 1781. Uh, but it is an army that marches. I think the big, less simplistic view is that there's an army that actually marches out of Valley Forge. I mean, with everything that goes on in those six months, and the um, deprivations and the lack of food and everything. But there's actually men for Von Stube in the train, and there's actually men and officers that uh, have learned it. Um, there is a great uh, account from um, uh, Johann Ebald, uh, who's, of course, a Hessian Jaeger. And he says that during um, the two years, the Americans have trained a great many officers who very often shame and excel our experienced officers. He said he examined the haversack, and inside the haversack of an officer, um, he finds excellent military books translated into their language, um, where it's to a lot of the British officers are beneath them to continue to read these manuals. I think that's showing that what uh, von Steuben is able to accomplish is his army that he teaches them to be a military, but these men are continuing to learn as they fight through the war. Um, and they're continuing to take this more seriously, I think, uh, as they march out because they have that um, a better supply system Washington has cemented his uh, uh, control over the command, and um, they're ready to, uh, to face it. Um, and I uh, to bring it back a little bit to the May 20th battle of Lafayette's forces. When they look like they're surrounded, they march off Barron Hill and extract a uh, retreat almost under fire across a, um, a secondary road across the Skullkill River and into um, back into uh, friendly territory without... Uh, breaking apart and being routed. And that's a sign right there um, in retreat that they're able to, they, they learned something under Von Steuben. Hmm. Okay, we have some uh, questions from our audience tonight. Uh, we'll start with uh, uh, one about the numbers. Uh, Washington had roughly 12,000 or so troops when he marched in. And uh, the question is, what were the, what were the numbers of the Continental Army when they marched out in the spring of 1778, approximately? Um, so the numbers uh, vary as well. I don't have the specific number in front of me, but um, he loses about 2,000 men to uh, succumb to illness and, uh, to, and disease. But he has uh, about 1,000 or so at Wilmington that uh, join in. Uh, that's the uh, Maryland, Delaware. 
So um, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head that Marks is out. I think it's close to about 10,000 uh, 10, or so. Um, but uh, I'm not sure if you do, John. But uh, the, uh, so the numbers also vary because of enlistments coming and going. The militia that join, um, especially the New Jersey militia that are active as well. Um, so, yeah, would say, uh, roughly about that number um, that, that come out up and down. And what was the relationship between the Continental Army and the local civilian population? Uh, I mean, it is, uh, I mean, Washington actually has to um, uh, place a cordon um, on some of the roads. Um, when Daniel Morgan's riflemen come back, they're, um, they're sent out as well. There are uh, some cavalry. Um, Lord Sterling has uh, some of the uh, troops on the outlying areas. And it is a little bit of impressment. That's how Green as well uh, helps fly some of the troops as well. Um, so it's initially, um, it, it seesaws back and forth. Um, obviously, the um, we believe that Valley Fords, are, uh, that fawn was not a good harvest, but it was. Um, we know that because the Continental Army is st starving, but the British um, are fed inside of Philadelphia. Um, yeah, obviously, they're supplied a little bit by the Delaware River, but there are foodstuffs coming in. They're watching the dust stop. And that, of course, will um, annoy the local populace. And so um, there are, uh, yeah, some issues as well. There's also um, um, issues as well with uh, desertions going out into the countryside. There is um, um, so some harboring of that. So the relationship um, is a seesaw one, the positive and negative. As the Army spends the winter, they're going to take more of the firewood. They're going to look at more uh, foodstuffs in the area. They're going to to scavenge out. Um, if men are being fed or anything supplied, they're going to find those things. And that puts a, um, uh, a dire effect on the local population to all obviously survive as well. Um, and that is a uh, conversation that Washington Green have about um, how to um, affect that relationship. Did, uh, did Martha Washington visit Valley Forge during that winter? Well, well, during the encampment. And if so, uh, what what? How many times did she come, and what was her role? Oh, so she, yeah, she does arrive. Uh, Martha Washington uh, is amazing. I mean, um, we don't know much about, of course, Washington and uh, Washington's relationship, um, Mister and Mrs. Uh, Washington, because she does burn the correspondence. But if you look, actions speak louder than words. She does come to Valley Forge. She does come to almost every winter encampment. Um, if I'm not uh, incorrect, I think she comes to all of them. Um, and she does um, supposedly uh, is prevents or gives the shawl to uh, Polly Cooper and um, the Oneida Native American to help show some of the uh, uh, continental uh, commissary officers and cooks how to cook courthouse soup. Um, she does provide a little semblance of uh, the home front, um, providing a, um, a, a table setting uh, there, providing a little comfort to Washington um, to uh, retreat to a domestic tranquility. Um, she is uh, not above um providing uh, i think it was selling socks or stockings and so forth uh pitching in um but it's remarkable i mean we always say oh what what martha washington traveled to see george but we always gloss over the fact that she traveled to see george washington through some of the winters um through rough roads uh with limit uh limited escorts and uh, a lady that is um uh, not in the best of health at all times as well um we um imagine just traveling from just from Mount Vernon to Valley Forge in the middle of the winter of 1778 and, and making it there. Um, shows her commitment to uh, George, commitment to the cause, and also that um, she's present there uh, providing a motherly figure for some of these junior officers. Washington, um, as military family, his uh, staff officers are um, mostly young, younger gentlemen, Alexander Hamilton, John Lawrence, um, and so forth. So she provides that motherly figure for them as well. Um. Was another question is about Washington's faith. Was was that a factor for him at Valley Forge, or uh, or is that is that too hard to get at based on the the source material? Uh, I mean, we always uh, we we like that iconic uh, painting of uh, Washington kneeling in the snow. Um, uh, Washington, I mean, um, his faith uh, is something that's always uh, has been discussed. Um, he um, uh, don't know exactly. Um, his commitment to religion at uh, Valley Forge. I mean, he does um, uh, believe in a higher being as well. Um, I do know that he um, will take a different carriage to the church later on and what poet church in, in Virginia, so he can leave at a certain time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he is, um, he does believe in a uh, higher calling. Uh, I think it's the word is deism or so forth. Um, 
Um, but there is chances he's more of a pra uh, practical um, um, realist and um, trying to um, doesn't have mu that much time to retreat into uh, religion. I mean, when you're dealing with the amount of paperwork that he is doing and the amount of uh, uh, turmoil, both um, internally and externally. So he, uh, but uh, there is, does he uh, pray? Probably. Does, would he go out in the snow to do it? Absolutely not. Um, but uh, it is one of those endearing images. Mm -hmm. um, when did the soldiers finally get paid? Uh, never. No, <laughs> there is a, a certain time. I mean, um, they, it's a good question. I mean, it, uh, it's at certain different, uh, different times, certain the states, bounties that come in, um, the, the payment is in arrears. Uh, obviously, the officers aren't paid for uh, years at a time. Um, so money trickles in, um, it, but you see it popping up here and there that uh, on account books. Um, a lot of my work before this was done on the first Maryland, and there are a lot of times where they're not paid for years at a time. Uh, including, uh, I know this is outside the uh, the spectrum of Valley Forge, but the whole 1780, 1781 campaign, they're not paid. Um, so it does come in. A lot of times it's what's up front um, when you uh, list the bounties, either land uh, or, or promises of land if you come out. Um, um, there is obviously as well the depreciation of continental currency. So even if you are paid, you're not quite sure what, uh, what that's worth. And so... Um, Money does trickle in, um, but there uh, some of them aren't paid at all. Okay, another question from our audience is: uh, Did the British consider attacking Washington in Valley Forge at any point from the entrance in December uh, through the winter? So initially, uh, I mean, Howe marches out um, uh, prior to the encampment there in early December um, with the small skirmishing at White Marsh. Um, how does retreat back in? Um, initially, he um, is more focused on opening the, uh, the the river, the Delaware River, to resupply himself. Um, so through, uh, um, so he's uh, facing um, the two forts down there, Mifflin and, and um, Mercer. Um, there is talk as well, but how um, how is more embroiled in uh, resigning and getting back out of uh, the, uh, the American colonies. Um, He's uh, sending notes back, um, and obviously he uh, now has to face the scrutiny of going back home and why did he not um, uh, align himself or coordinate with Burgoyne um, and, the and the faithful Saratoga campaign. Um, there is obviously some thought, but uh, winter is a tough time to move. Um, he, uh, Washington does a good uh, case of subterfuge of keeping um, – him cordoned off um, and not knowing um, one of the benefits of Valley Forge is it does sit in a little bit of bowl with um, defenses. So it is it's tough to get to, to Washington himself. So does he consider it? Probably passes his mind. Um, but um, he's ensconed in Philadelphia. He's got a nice house, um, plenty of good company, and he's more worried about uh, his resignation being accepted and, and leaving this war behind. One last question before we wrap it up here, Phil. If if Morristown was colder, snowier, worse for the two winters that the army was there, why is it that Valley Forge is so iconic and better remembered than Morristown? What is it about the Valley Forge experience? So I'm not sure if he's watching, but there's a great historian working with the Park Service, uh, Eric Olson there. Um, and I asked him that question when I was a, uh, a ranger there at Morristown. And I said, well, I was writing Valley Forge. I felt like I was cheating a little bit. I'm working at Morristown, writing Valley Forge. And I asked him um, if Valley, uh, Morristown was colder in the Army. He said, well, um, put it bluntly, he said there, were, um, there wasn't as much suffering. Not Less men died. Uh, less, um, the lessons they learned at Valley Forge on digging or building the cabins, on inoculation, on a supply line and so forth um, affected it there. We were too successful at Morristown. Where Valley Forge, um, garners up. I mean, if you Google Valley Forge the winter, uh, when, and it graces um, one of the first pages of my book is the uh, Trego painting of them marching in. And that is uh, one, one of the, for me, the significant paintings, uh, although it's not uh, factual, but it shows the men marching uh, with torn stockings, barefooted, but uh, cheerful expressions and so forth as they head in. Um, 
but we learn lessons at Valley Forge. Um, and we learn um, the lessons we learn carries through the harder winters at Morristown. But because there's not as much death suffering or because um, there's not the Von Steuben training um, or the, um, the political factions that happen, uh, it's just a, a more standard sufferable winner that, um, that doesn't, doesn't get written about. Okay, Phil, thank you very much. Uh, folks, Phil of Greenwald um, coming out with a new book here that you can see, The Winter That Won the War, The Winter of Cabinet Valley Forge, 1777 to 1778. Looking forward to it uh, very much. Uh, hope to get it here shortly. And uh, Phil, thanks again. It was great to have you. It was an interesting talk and uh, congratulations on the book. Oh, yeah, thank you for having me. And um, yeah, and I hope a lot of people go out and enjoy the book, but more importantly, head to Valley Forge um, and uh, take in the sights.